If you would like free newsletters, as you see here, on a wide variety of subjects, from a biblical perspective, just email your request to cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com, as you see on the screen. These newsletters can help viewers who have family or friends trapped in religious cults or false religions, so take advantage of the opportunity. Besides newsletters, our ministry has many Christian tracts and other literature available as well at no charge. Don't sit on the sidelines, but prepare yourself and those you come in contact with. Remember the old saying, one life will soon be passed, only what is done for Christ will last. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Christian Answers would like to announce a conference called Former Catholics for Christ Conference in Springfield, Illinois. The conference will cover in defense of sola scriptura, scripture alone, sola fide, faith alone, sola Christo, Christ alone, and sola gratia, grace alone. Four guest speakers, Robert M. Zins, director of A Christian Witness to Roman Catholicism, author, conference speaker, and apologist. Mike Gendron, director of Proclaiming the Gospel, author, conference speaker, evangelist, and apologist. Tim Kaufman, author, conference speaker, and apologist. Cecil Andrews, director of Take Heed Ministries from Northern Ireland, conference speaker, and apologist. spoken several times about the Roman uh, Catechism, uh, Roman Catholicism Catechism. When was it written? By who? And how did it deviate from the truth? Now, the second last part of that is very large. But I start out, when was it written and who wrote it? Yeah, it was written in 1994 by the then Cardinal Ratzinger, who later on became Pope Benedict. He's the doctrinal guru of the Catholic Church. He's still alive. He's 92 years old, but he has stepped down as the Pope, and now we have Pope Francis, who is more pastoral, but not doctrinal. Uh, just by way of interest, the, the forward to it was written by Pope John Paul II, who said it was a sure norm for teaching the faith. So he believed that everything uh, that was in it was a, the proper way to understand the Christian faith. Well, regarding the second part of the question, how much of it is true? Very little, as you've been able to witness from the four presentations so far. The Roman Catholic theology is antithetical to biblical theology. Okay, so that, that'll give you an idea. And one one of the good things about it. Uh, if you're trying to read Vatican II's or going back to Trent, those are very difficult to read. This is a modernized version. So I have a copy in my office. You can go down to a bookstore or order it and get it. It's about, you know, it's, I don't know, 800 pages long or so, 1,000, I don't know. But uh, it has a good index. So you can look up faith alone or, or the, the baptism, what they teach on baptism or purgatory. They'll take you to sections and you can read it. Uh, it's not the kind of book most people are going to sit down and read uh, right through but it makes a great index, great uh, reference. Uh, and they're really good, especially if you're dealing with Catholics, uh, because uh, they might, well, we don't believe that. Well, take them right to the catechism. Here's what the catechism says you believe. So it's helpful. If, if, I, could, uh, if I could add something to the yeah. catechism, 
it's important to know that when you're talking with Roman Catholics and you ask them what they believe, they often will just say, well, uh, I'll just go to my catechism. I'm sure I can trust the catechism. But the catechism is shifting sand. And there, there was one in 1869 that denied that infallibility, papal infallibility, was an article of the Catholic faith and that it was a Protestant invention. And then the next year, they invented papal infallibility, and the catechism was updated to say that the Catholic Church has always held that the Pope is infallible, and it's an apostolic teaching. The original edition of the 1996 catechism accidentally said that it was the Pharisee who went home justified instead of the tax collector. And it also said that capital punishment is a valid institution of God. And Pope Francis recently updated that catechism to say that, uh, no, we, we don't believe that capital punishment is, is good. It's shifting sand, and that's the important thing to know. Well, on the one hand, it's a great reference. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it just changes all the time. <laughs> yeah. So th there's no truth in Roman Catholicism. There's just stuff that they said and then more stuff that they said. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, Here's a, another question, very general question, but a very important one. How do you answer someone who says the Bible is corrupted and out of date? So we're talking about uh, Sola Scriptura. How do we know it's not corrupted and out of date? Big question, I know that. Somebody have a little answer? Well, the Bible has much to say about itself regarding Scripture. It is inerrant. It is infallible. It is eternal, it's forever settled in heaven, so we can look to the original manuscripts and know that what we're reading is not corrupted. What's corrupted has been some of the translations. We talked a little bit about the Jehovah Witness. They have corrupted the translation of the Bible. The Roman Catholic Church has done the same. In fact, the original English version of the Bible that was taken from the Latin Vulgate actually said that in Genesis 3, she will crush the head of the serpent, re referring to Mary. That's why you can go into a Catholic bookstore today and you can see a statue of Mary with the serpent's head under her heel on top of a globe. It all goes back to the misinterpretation, mistranslation of Genesis 3. Anyone else? I would have to respond to anybody who said that with the question of what makes you think so. Because there's something behind that statement that the Bible is out of date, it's corrupted. And just don't panic when they say that, just ask for more information. What makes you think so? What part of the Bible do you think is corrupted? How do you think we have our Bible? What do you, as Mike says, what do you think the Bible says about itself? And then I think I would appeal to Jesus Christ. If they were a Christian, saying that the Bible is corrupted and not trustworthy, I would say then Jesus Christ is fallible for sure. And he missed the point because it was Jesus Christ who quoted the word of God when he wanted to make a point. And he quoted it exactly as it was written. Now there are times when parts of the Old Testament are brought into the New Testament with further and greater explanation because of the redemptive history moving forward. But in the main, all of the writers of the New Testament referred to the Old Testament as the Word of God, sure and certain. And so uh, I usually get better results if I ask people to explain themselves and to explain what do you mean by corruption and why would you say such a thing? And then maybe, maybe you could take it one step at a time with them and point out that uh, perhaps they didn't really understand the preservation of the Word of God by God and the authorship of the scriptures by God. It's all God-breathed without error, and maybe they just don't understand that sort of thing. But I think, that, I think the best thing you could do is just ask them questions why they are asking you these questions. Where is it coming from? 
and that usually opens up a dialogue. I'd want that. Yeah, I would endorse what Rob has just said. I think it's a good thing to sometimes uh, answer a question with a question. Because again, uh, just slightly different, you hear people saying there are so many contradictions in the Bible. Well, uh, my qu uh, response to that is, well, can you give me an example, please? And uh, very often what they try to come up with is not actually a contradiction if properly understood in the context and so on. So responding to a question with a question, I think, is a good strategy. So the question concerns the Catholic Bible, uh, where they stand on that. Okay. Well, the uh, Catholic Bible is corrupt and out of date. <laughs> well, let me say this about that. The Catholics are told not to trust anything that doesn't have their official imprimatur. They're definitely told not to t trust any Protestant Bible. So my encouragement to all of you is if you have a Catholic who owns a Bible, sit down with an open Bible of their own. They've got the same 66 books that we do. They've added the Apocrypha, but you don't have to go there. Take them down the Roman road. Show them justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So what you do is you want to eliminate any obstacles for them coming to faith. So rather than using your own Bible, open their Bible and lead them to salvation in that. Yeah, and, and I'll add that I, I came to Christ reading the New American Bible, which is a Roman Catholic right. translation. When I said that a Roman Catholic Bible is corrupt and out of date, I'm talking about the Vulgate that Jerome translated. He was simply not equal to the task, and he, he really did corrupt the Scriptures. So you can't trust the Vulgate. Not the problem is that's the official version of Roman Catholicism. That's the official Bible. So the Vulgate is not to be trusted because it says... Uh, Jesus came announcing the gospel of the kingdom, which was do penance instead of repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Do penance for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jerome did, in fact, corrupt the, the Bible when he translated it into Latin. So it, you do have to uh, exert some caution, mm -hmm. but Mike is right. If you can get them to study the scriptures, you're getting a lot closer. To where they need to be. Okay. Uh, maybe a follow up thing uh, on this. Uh, so let's say somebody's been reading Bart Ehrman and he says the Bible's corrupt and he gives all these pages of corruptions and, and so forth. Uh, that's a, another big question. Uh, somebody has a helpful answer that might help somebody that is in that category? Yeah, Bart Ehrman. I don't know a lot about Bart Ehrman, except that he is a, a, a total apostate who once professed faith but has drifted away totally. Uh, he has written helpful material on the historicity of the life of Christ, but he, he certainly doesn't go with uh, what is contained in the Bible. He doesn't believe it. Uh, but that's about as far as I know where Bart Ehrman is concerned. And I would encourage them to look to the Lord Jesus Christ who said, I am the truth. He said, my word is truth. He said, I came to testify to the truth. He said, everybody on the side of truth listens to me. So if you're really honestly seeking the truth, why would you look anywhere else other than Christ and his word? Our goal is to get Catholics to read the Bible, to abide in the word of God, because Jesus said, if you're truly a disciple of mine, you will abide in my word, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, free from any kind of religious deception, any kind of religious bondage. Uh, just as a PS, and Bart Ehrman, I've just remembered, uh, about seven years ago I was in debate, public debate, with a Muslim spokesman, and he was trying to quote Christian sources to refute things that are in the Bible. And one of the Christian sources he referred to was Bart Ehrman. So uh, that shows you just how far Bart Ehrman has drifted. Yeah, just, I, would, I would add yeah. as well that in my experience, take it one step at a time. You can be overwhelmed by accusations. 
somebody can come up to you and say, I don't believe there is a God, prove there is a God to me. Well, it only took two seconds to say that, but it's going to take more than two seconds to undo that. So, whether you are accosted by an atheist, or uh, I did a conference in New Jersey once, and I gave what I thought was an okay message. I mean, I never try to critique myself, that's too dangerous. But uh, it, it seemed that the audience was responding well, and there were these three guys waiting for me. And I walked out the side door because I just felt I didn't want to talk with these three guys, but they followed me. And one of them said, you know, that was a pretty good message. Why don't you use the Word of God next time? And I said, I thought I did. And they said, oh no, oh no. You used a corrupted text. Anybody who doesn't understand that the King James Version of the Bible is the only pure translation handed down by God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, simply is using a corrupted text. So I said, how am I going to undo this in 10 seconds? And I think the Lord was with me, and I've never forgotten it. I just looked at him and I said, what part of God's truth have I corrupted in the message that I just gave using the corrupted text that you accused me of using? Done. Conversation's over. If, if my message didn't corrupt God's word, then what's your point? So sometimes you have to take it small steps at a time. Now if you had a whole hour to sit down with them and you opened up the KJV and you opened up the New American Standard or you opened up another text you might be using and compare it and then of course you're going to have to go back to the Greek text and of course they're not going to accept the uh, early textual manuscript evidence because that's corrupted. They're going to go with the majority text and you're into this battle. But sometimes you just can't do that right away. So think of us the simplest of answers and take it a little bit at a time. So. Yeah, we could have a whole conference on that alone, right? Good. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, a big one. It's an important thing. Uh, I would say on the Bart Ehrman thing and, and others, uh, for those that are familiar with that, he's very popular. And uh, he, he was a Moody Bible Institute graduate, by the way, who uh, went away from the faith. But uh, I would say that just on the short answer is there are good answers to what he claims that people have written about. So don't let it blow you away if you run into that. Uh, seek out the good answers from good books and good good scholars who have answered those questions. Uh, he sounds very scholarly and very very persuasive, and people like that do if you don't know your stuff. But uh, others know their stuff. Here's a question that kind of goes along with that. Again, a fairly important, very important one for those that are trying to witness to Catholics. Do most people who attend Roman Catholic churches really understand what the Catholic Church teaches? That's a, that's a good um, I, I would say that most Roman Catholics don't have a full grasp of what their church teaches because uh, uh, I know uh, Catholic, former Catholic priests like uh, Bart Brewer and Richard Bennett uh, they would have encountered people as they were seeking to witness to them now that they themselves had been converted. And some Roman Catholics would say, well, I, I don't believe that, or I don't believe that, and so on. Uh, sometimes I get Roman Catholics saying, I don't believe that. And I would say to them, well, do you realize that your church actually places an anathema upon you if you don't believe that? And they just kind of shrug their shoulders. They, they, they don't really take it too seriously. Uh, but certainly, I, I think uh, when you're speaking to Roman Catholics, if they say, uh, I don't really believe that, I think it's important to point out how their own church actually views them and pray that the Lord might use it to unsettle them. Yeah, that's why it's important to ask questions while you're witnessing, because when you look at 1.2 or 1.3 billion Roman Catholics, it really covers a very broad spectrum. You've got the 
Roman Catholics who haven't stepped foot in a church in 15 or 20 years, but they'll be the first ones to come and defend their religion if you say anything contrary to what they've been taught. Then you've got the twice a year Catholics who come on Resurrection Sunday and Christmas, all the way to the other extreme where you've got very devout Roman Catholics and even some of the former Protestants that have apostatized and become Roman Catholics are now the teaching authority of the church, and many Catholics are now listening to these former Protestants to learn how to defend the Catholic faith against evangelicals who come witnessing to them. So you've got a complete spectrum of Roman Catholics, but what I like to do when I engage Roman Catholics is just ask them, how does your church or religion teach that you have any hope of going to heaven? Do you know what you hear so often? I'm not sure my church actually teaches us that. Shouldn't your church teach the most important issue we all face? What must I do to be forgiven? How can I be reconciled to a holy God? How can I have any hope of going to heaven? But they don't know the answer because the church hasn't taught them that. Because ultimately, their faith is in their religion. Many Catholics, and I say the majority of them, go to church on Sunday because it's mandatory. If they don't go, they're committing a mortal sin. So they come in late, they check their brain at the door, they go through the sacrifice of the Eucharist, and then they're the first ones to leave because they've put in their prison sentence and they have avoided mortal sin. But it's really a mindless, empty religion. That's what most Catholics are embracing at this point. Someone has asked a question that kind of goes with that concerning eternal security. Uh, the Church of Rome teaches that you can be, uh, you can be severed from Christ. Uh, they reference here Galatians 5, 4, 2 Corinthians 6, 1, uh, that uh, by doing certain things you can lose your salvation. Of course, that's a big part of Roman Catholicism. So uh, you've already touched on that a little bit, uh, Mike, but uh, let's follow up a little bit more. So... Uh, how would you how would you answer a Catholic who believes they can lose their salvation, uh, or maybe lose it on a regular basis? And, you know that whole that whole issue. Well, I, I think if everyone has been listening carefully, uh, in Roman Catholicism, you're never allowed to have assurance of salvation. It's a bit like snakes and ladders. You know, you, you get up so far and you're doing well, and then boom, down you go, and you've got to start again. You know, one day you're justified, the next day you're not justified. Uh, so really and truly, there is absolutely no assurance of salvation. So yes, they do believe you can fall out of a state of grace and that's when you have to go back to the sacraments to get your grace supplies topped up again uh, and that will enable you then to do works which will merit uh, favor in the sight of God. So in Rome there's no assurance of eternal salvation that would be a mortal sin, the sin of presumption and to assume you're going to heaven according to Rome will actually take you to hell. Yeah, the real key here is, have you been born again? The Bible makes it very clear, anyone who has been born again can never die again spiritually. How can anyone who has been made perfect forever now be made imperfect? You know, the promises of the gospel are there throughout Scripture. Now, some of the difficult verses in Hebrews 6 and 10, I think you might have been referring to, these are for professing believers who sit on the fence. They have the head knowledge, but they have not been born again. And so the warnings are for them to trust in Christ alone, believe that you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, according to Scripture alone. Once you have been born again, born from above, then there's every promise in the Bible that says you can never, ever lose your salvation. It is a free gift of God, and our salvation is secured by the promises and the power of God. I encourage people to read 1 Peter chapter 1, where it shows that our eternal inheritance is reserved in heaven and kept by the very power of God. Is there anything in this universe more powerful than God? And yet that's the promise. The inheritance is kept by the power of God for those who have been born again of the Spirit. 
Yeah, I would say the category of salvation is foreign to Roman Catholicism. You can't lose something that you've never had. And you can't lose something that you're not familiar with. So it would be an oxymoron for a Roman Catholic to say, I lost my salvation. The best he could say would be that my sins have rendered me in the eyes of God right back to the beginning of where I started and I have to start over again. Um, it's, it's as Cecil said, there, there's, there's, no, there's no teaching or explanation of salvation itself. It's a foreign concept to them. They're just simply hopeful of going to heaven by gathering through the sacraments a good amount of grace from God that will secure at least a landing in purgatory. I have said uh, in response to the salvation issue many times to Roman Catholics, even those in my own family, they are not good enough to go to heaven ever and they're not bad enough to go to hell, ever. And thank God for purgatory, because that's their safety net. So if you say there is no purgatory, you're either going to one place or the other, that would be very difficult for them to grasp, to understand, because they're counting on the safety net. But that's exactly what you have to do. There is no purgatory. You're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. Now let's talk about what does the Bible teach about getting to heaven and avoiding hell. But yeah, it's a, it's a different language for them because they're not allowed to think in those categories. Yeah. Sure. This one over here? Oh, bottle. Bottle. I said Bible. All right, then. Let me give you an analogy of the Catholic life. This bottle is symbolic of your soul. Inside is called sanctifying grace. If you die with a full bottle, you go straight to heaven. But it's kind of impossible because this bottle leaks. It leaks because of venial sins, small things, losing your temper, uh, petty theft. Uh, you commit a mortal sin, it empties out. You die with an empty bottle, you go straight to hell. So, full bottle, you go to heaven. Empty bottle, you go to hell. Anywhere in between, you go to purgatory to finish the purification process. Because this level keeps fluctuating. You wanted to increase it, receive the sacraments, go to the Eucharist, do good deeds, keep the commandments. You lose it because of small, insignificant, venial sins. You know, felonies and misdemeanors is what's on the Catholic mind. If I don't commit any felonies, I'm eventually going to get to heaven through purgatory. So the felonies are murder, bank robbery, adultery, and missing mass on Sunday. So if he goes to mass, he's going to get to heaven. Thank you. Purgatory. You can have the bottle. <laughs> okay, uh, that's a good analogy. That kind of follows up on a little bit, though. Uh, another question has to do with the justification is a process. Uh, for the Roman Catholics, so they're, they're always in process, like you're saying there. Uh, so at what point would uh, there be a final justification? So I'm going to move into a two-part question here. We've got the process of justification of ultimately leading to a final justification when you are in heaven. How would a Roman Catholic ever know when they're going to get there? Well, yeah, when I'm speaking about uh, the difference between uh, evangelical justification and Rome, I say, you know, Rome is a process, uh, whereas the biblical justification is a pronouncement. It's a legal verdict handed down by the righteous judge of all the earth. And the justification process for uh, Roman Catholics starts at baptism, and uh, you get the initial dose of grace, and then as you become a teenager, uh, you start sinning and you lose that, and you've got to 
uh, get it re-topped up again through confirmation and then through the Mass. And all of the sacraments are always topping up the, the justifying grace that you've lost uh, because of sin. And your best hope, as has already been said, is that uh, you will die in a state where you're not good enough to go to heaven, but you're not bad enough to go to hell. So you go to purgatory, and then you will suffer uh, to discharge the outstanding temporal punishment that still lies to your account. Those back on earth, they can help with prayers and with paying for masses and so on. And, and so uh, there's no defined time given, but the hope is that at some point in purgatory, God will say, right, that's it. Your outstanding debt has been discharged and you're now justified and the gates of heaven are open for you. So it's, uh, you know, the living and the dead are, are captive to the Roman church and have to pay in to try and get some soul eventually justified. So that's the, 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 the process as I understand it. Yeah, the major difference between biblical justification and Roman Catholicism is the Bible says that justification is instantaneous. You have the picture of the gavel coming down in heaven and you're acquitted of your sin. You're pronounced righteous, not because you are, but because the righteousness of Jesus Christ has been imputed or credited to your account. But in Roman Catholicism, justification is temporal and it's infusion. You have to receive more and more sacramental grace to become more and more inherently righteous. In Roman Catholicism, it is not a legal declaration. They define justification as becoming inherently righteous as you become more and more righteous through the sacraments and through good works. Biblical justification is forever. By one offering, he is made perfect forever, those who are being sanctified. In Roman Catholicism, every time you commit a mortal sin, you become de-justified. Now you must regain the grace of justification through confessing to a priest and doing the works necessary to gain a right status before God. And so, in one sense, you could say Roman Catholicism has intermixed the justification with sanctification. We know that those who are justified begin the process of sanctification by putting to death the evil deeds of the flesh and conforming your life to the life of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. But Rome just mixes those two together, and they look for a final glorification, final justification, but they can't tell you when because it's based on a length of time in purgatory and how faithful your family members are in having the sacrifice of the Mass offered on your behalf to gain indulgences that remit the temporal punishment for sin that you died with because of venial sin. And can I say that venial sin actually perpetuates the first lie of the devil in the Garden of Eden? Remember what he said? You surely shall not die if you break God's command. That's Roman Catholicism, venial sin perpetuating the lie of the devil, and that's why the Apostle Paul said, in latter times, some will fall away from the faith to follow doctrines of demons. Okay, a second part to this, and I think Tim was the one that mentioned it. I'm not sure someone has alluded to it, but uh, we're moving into, into Protestantism, evangelicalism. There's now this idea of a future justification. Uh, Piper is one who's talked about that. There's others. It's been in some books of uh, some other people as well. Uh, this is a new concept for most in Protestantism. Uh, what is the idea? What is Piper trying to say? Is uh, what is a difference in, in his idea? Of, uh, it, is there a difference between uh, some kind of initial justification and a final justification? Because he says final justification is by works or initial justification is by faith. Very confusing. So anybody have any insight on that? Well, uh, I'll just say that this is the constant assault on the gospel, and it's been going on for millennia, and it's not going to change. The, the names sometimes change, but the substance is the same. I will tell you that the, uh, the Auburn Avenue Federal Vision New Perspective on Paul movement from some time ago 
basically was teaching something very similar, is that you, uh, you get in by faith, but you stay in by faithfulness. You may remember Doug Wilson realized, woke up one day and realized that justification by faith alone is a truncated version of the gospel and realized that it should be justification by faithfulness, which of course imports works righteousness into our justification. But I would say that because Matthew 25 makes reference to the good works of the sheep just before entering into their inheritance, and because Matthew 12 refers to future justification by words, that is, those are the texts that are often used in order to show that there will be a final justification, a future justification. It's very difficult to pin down exactly what John Piper calls it, uh, but, but the substance is an eschatological future justification or final justification that will contemplate our works. The problem with that, I've already talked about the problem as it manifests in Matthew 12, is that Jesus doesn't say that our final justification is by works. You have to actually add that word to the text in order to get to justification by works. But the other problem with it is when you get to when you get to Matthew 25, it says, enter into your inheritance. After and it talks about the good works of the of the sheep, right? But Paul has already told us that the inheritance is not by the law. He says it explicitly in Galatians chapter 3. The inheritance is not by the law, it's by the promise. And you know what? Feeding the poor, taking care of them and giving them clothes, that's, that's in the law. Read Deuteronomy chapter 16. That's the law. You're supposed to provide for the widow, provide for the poor, the stranger, the fatherless, and give them food and clothing. And those are the works that Christ recites just before granting them access to their inheritance, right? But Paul has already told us that he learned from Christ that the inheritance is not of the law, which means that their entrance into the inheritance cannot be based on the fact that they fed and clothed the hungry and the naked. We have to look at it from the context of the preceding parables, all of which display Gentiles being treated as if they were Jews and unbelieving Jews being treated as if they were Gentiles. And God's jealousy about the Jewish idolatry burns to the lowest hell. And right up to the last possible minute, he'll be talking about how his people were better at obeying the law than the Jews were. But nevertheless, their justification is by faith alone apart from those works. Jesus does talk about the good works of the saints. His parables are full of them. But it's always to show the Jews that these Gentiles are better at doing this than you are. But nevertheless, they're justified by faith apart from those works. It's when Matthew 25 and Mark 12 are read outside of their context, and I will just say particularly outside of the context of the jealousy that the Lord uh, caused Moses to foresee, that they simply look at it as, wow, Jesus talks about works, and then they get into heaven. Must be justification by works. I will say finally on that note that the, the Lord separates his sheep from the goats before he ever mentions a single work, which means that they were separated for eternity on a righteousness that did not take works into account. We have to keep that in mind. The full context and the full revelation of God's word must be considered. And those who are advancing a final justification by works are almost, well, they are always taking those texts out of context. I, I could preach a long time on that. <laughs> I'd just add that there has been a long-standing conflict in the body of Christ over the nature of faith and the place of works. Okay. Uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s, there was a huge eruption in the evangelical world over something called Lordship Salvation. Mike alluded to it in his message. Could you have Jesus as Savior and not as Lord? And if you said no to that, then were you teaching a work salvation? 
Well, all of this goes round and round and round and still is going round in evangelical circles. So it doesn't surprise me that there are those who would want to take good works done in faith and make it as a portion or partial ground of their future justification. But I think um, if you don't get faith right and the nature of faith, then you're going to have these kinds of problems. And I uh, uh, wrote an article in response to John Piper's view, because I think he's wrong. And uh, I, wrote, I just finished an, an essay on a book written by Steve Lawson entitled The Cost, because I think he's wrong. I think in the zeal to steer people away from what is known as easy believism, there is now become in the evangelical church this overriding threat that if your works aren't sufficient in your, a future reckoning by God, then you may not be justified in the end. And uh, I know in Steve Lawson's case, he's just sick at heart for so many people who say they're Christians but they don't act like Christians, they don't talk like Christians, they don't believe like Christians, they don't live like Christians, and they go to places of worship where there's no really good teaching, there's no real good theology, there's no good doctrine, and so they just, what are they? Well, it goes back to the nature of faith. Uh, we didn't have this problem a hundred years ago because when you talked about the nature of faith, you were relying upon the Protestant Reformation, which said we are saved by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. Every single reformer understood that if you are born from above and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you understand that the ground of your justification is the righteousness of Christ that's outside of you, that kind of faith produces good works by necessity. But we, have, we live in a world today where if you walk the aisle, you pray the prayer, raise your hand, and say, I believe in Jesus, and I trust him as my personal Savior, then you're saved. Well, maybe, because it'll prove itself out in your life. And that's why the Puritans would say, hopefully converted, if somebody had come to Christ. Perhaps we need to use that kind of language a little bit more. Hopefully converted. Let's see if there's a change. Let's see if all things are new. Let's see if you have the mind of Christ. Let's see if you have perseverance. And if not, then let's go back to where you started. But it is truly a, a bit of a sticky wicket because it all centers around the nature of faith and the ground of justification. So I just want to be on record as saying that I don't believe that there's any other ground of justification now or in the future other than the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. And works add nothing to it they just give proof of it. And that's the way it, uh, I think, unfolds in Scripture. Okay, and uh, just a couple minutes left, perhaps. Uh, here's some a uh, little bit easier ones, not quite as deep. Uh, the Promise Keepers is resurrecting in 2020. Uh, what should we know about this? Or do you know anything about it? Kind of on the ecumenical issue. Yeah. Uh, someone mentioned this to me in recent days that uh, Promise Keepers was sort of rising like Lazarus to reappear. Uh, my only past experience of Promise Keepers was actually uh, I had to talk at the first uh, Ex-Catholics for Christ conference oh, 22, 23 years ago. And Promise Keepers was very much on the go at that stage. Uh, Mr. McCartney and so on had set it up. And just prior to that conference, they changed their basis of faith. Uh, they used to believe in salvation by grace alone, through faith alone. 
And of course, that precluded any Roman Catholics being involved in the organizing committee or anything of that nature. But they decided to change their basis of faith and take out the word alone. And of course, Rob emphasized very much the importance of the word alone. So if they are uh, resurrecting again, I assume that they will still go with that amended statement of faith, which would not be a solid basis of faith. Yeah, the organization is really a misnomer because there's only one promise keeper, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to put our trust in him and his righteousness and not try to develop our own righteousness by trying to keep the promise or the law. I will say this about Bill McCartney. He is a former Roman Catholic who, by his own words, left the Catholic Church not because of different doctrine or because of a different gospel, he left because he thought the evangelical church could teach his children better theology than he was receiving in the Roman Catholic Church. The president of Promise Keepers was Mike Temis. He's also a Roman Catholic, and so it became a very ecumenical organization. It denied the exclusivity and the purity of the gospel. It became more inclusive. And so that's why it had such a large following initially. And many of the early speakers were evangelical leaders, and so it gave you the uh, observation to an outsider that maybe this was an evangelical movement, but they didn't look at the history of the founder and the president and see the Roman Catholic ties. Could I just make a, a, a point on all this? My, I guess my point is I don't get the point. I'm not a joiner, I guess. I'm not a member of the Moose Club the Elks Club, the Kiwanis. I'm not a member of the Masons. I'm not a member of an organization that would get together and say, let's make some promises. If my wife found out that I was making promises, she would say, really? I thought you were a Christian. She knows you can't keep promises, not all of them. You're gonna fail. So I don't get the point of all of this. I agree with Mike, there's only one promise keeper. And we stand before an audience of one every minute, every day of our life. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can't even promise him anything. Is there anybody in here who would risk promising anything to Jesus Christ? You wouldn't, would you? Because you know, even in a redeemed state, you're subject to failure. So I think that these promise keeper things are false hopes, they're false, they're clubs that try to generate a, a bunch of stuff inside of you to make promises that you can't keep mm -hmm. and you won't keep and then they're just fads after that. Yeah. Remember the purpose driven life? That improved our nation. <laughs> How about the prayer of Jabez? Everybody's riding around in a Rolls Royce now. It's crazy, this stuff that comes down the pike. Why can't we just settle in with the Lord in his work in humble adoration for what he has done for us that we contributed nothing to? Uh, here's, a, here's a practical question concerning uh, people that are talking to Roman Catholics about prayer. So uh, who, uh, what passages would help us concerning who to address in prayer, God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit, Mary the Mother of Jesus. And so uh, while most of us have a pretty good handle on that, if we're dealing with Roman Catholics who are praying to Mary or the saints or whatever, what scriptures would you use to help with that? Well, it's clear in the, the Word of God, the, the Lord himself was asked by the disciples, you know, how should we pray? And so he, he gave them a model prayer, uh, our Father who art in heaven. Uh, so I, I believe we have the right to address our Father in heaven. He's Abba, Father. Uh, I think it's right, too, to pray to the Lord. Uh, there are occasions uh, where people pray to the Lord. I think of Peter walking on the water. And all of a sudden, he started to sink, and so he prayed, Lord, save me, he cried out. Uh, Stephen, as he was dying, prayed to the Lord, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. 
And uh, I think uh, so we can address the Father and uh, the Son in prayer, uh, motivated by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, as regards uh, praying to Mary or other departed saints, personally, I regard that uh, as necromancy. Uh, these people are dead, and we are not to seek to communicate with the dead, according to Deuteronomy chapter 18. And so it's taking you into the realm of the occult. Uh, and I think the responses that people get to these prayers, particularly to Mary, where you maybe get these apparitions supposedly appearing, uh, I think those are occultic and demonic in nature. So, uh, no, we don't pray to, to dead people. We pray to uh, the Lord and the Father in the power of the Spirit. Yeah, we pray to the Father through the Son. Jesus is our one mediator between God and man. And so that's why we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. But I challenge Roman Catholics who believe that they need to pray to Mary, the repetitious prayers. You know, Jesus said don't pray repetitiously like the pagans do. But also I challenge them, show me one place in the Bible where any God-fearing man prays to anyone other than God. Our goal is to get them into the scriptures. Tell them if you can find one instant where a God-fearing person prays to anyone other than God, then I'll start praying to them as well. Challenge them. Get them into the word. If you like our YouTube channel, please subscribe by clicking on the subscribe button and then by also clicking the bell above to get an automatic update whenever we produce another YouTube video for our See Answers TV channel. Please share our videos with your friends and relatives. May God bless you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. See related videos by tapping or clicking screens.